Good evening, Mrs. Potter. How are you? Uh, fine. Uh, a colonial craftsman series is so interesting. How did this come to be? Well, that's a, a rather short and a long story. Uh, it was born in a taxi cab. Of the American craftsman? American craftsman. Well, my American craftsman was born in a taxi cab, <laughs> not the, the American yes. craftsman. Uh, as I recall uh, the incident, uh, I had uh, made uh, some inquiries at uh, my publisher as to whether or not he would be interested in having me write a book. And he said, yes. And uh, he said, how would you like to write a book about professions? And I said, no. <laughs> and uh, at any rate, uh, as I recall, we got into a taxi cab and we were off to a luncheon. And I turned to him and I said, well, why why not do something on crafts rather than professions? And he said, well, why not make it colonial crafts? And I said, that was fine. And by the time we uh, uh, drove all the way from 53rd Street and Lexington Avenue, I think down to 14th Street, and this was in New York, uh, the entire series was born and um, the cab uh, driver was paid. I, I think my publisher paid for the, for the <laughs> ride. And um, uh, as we got out of the cab, uh, we had decided that the first two books would be The Glassmakers and The Silversmiths, and it happened as quickly as that. Uh, that's interesting. Why did you uh, decide to do The Glassmakers and The uh, Silversmiths first? Well, I knew more about uh, those two particular crafts. I feel that uh, as a painter, which I am basically, uh, and I like to think of myself as a craftsman anyway, I'm interested in the technical end of, of, of the arts, uh, that... Uh, I knew more about glass, I knew more about silver, uh, and I thought that this would be a logical uh, beginning. Um, well, it is a good beginning. I had, I had been to glass factories, both here and abroad, and, and uh, uh, I'd uh, seen much American silver in, in museums, and uh, I did some reading in this without having a, a project of this sort in mind, mm -hmm. and so I was rather well equipped to start out with, uh, with some basic knowledge of this. Well, you went on to quite a long list. Did you make this list to, to start with, uh, what you already do? Yes, I made a basic list, and uh, this list had approximately oh, 20 titles in it, uh, including such things as uh, not only all the titles which are now in print, but uh, tinsmiths and charcoal makers and clock makers and lamp makers. Now, not all of these things would, would become books, and uh, the list as, we, as it now is is a constantly changing uh, list. Uh, this is one reason, I believe, uh, why we decided not to print the projected titles in the books themselves. I see. Because uh, we are coming up with information here that, uh, in my research at any rate, that uh, changes this list all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, well, now, how do you go about to get the materials uh, for this, uh, for these books? Well, of course, there are museums. And uh, we also have restorations all over the United States. Uh, when you take uh, such a thing as paper making, for example, uh, to give you an instance, uh, I discussed the uh, idea of burnishing paper to harden it, that mm -hmm, is to yes. polish the paper so that it, it, it uh, is something more than just a piece of blotting paper. And in fact, the illustration shows the, the craftsman using a burnisher. Mm -hmm. Well, now I have a set of burnishers. Uh, we today, even though uh, we use uh, our equipment in a, in a different way, we are still using some of the medieval equipment that, that uh, was used uh, three, four, five hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. And I have a set of burnishers here, uh, which I burnish papers with for one reason or another. I can even burnish gold with it, gold mm -hmm. leaf. Uh, so I knew how to use those tools. Mm -hmm. And there are other tools here. Uh, so it was just a, uh, uh, a question of uh, applying my knowledge mm -hmm. uh, in my craft to this and getting it all historically accurate. When you are doing a book like this, do you do the story first, uh, the whole story first, and then the pictures? Yes, the story does come first, and then the pictures, and uh, I always cuss out the author <laughs> because he that's me of course and he produces he writes things that I can't possibly illustrate and, uh, and this creates a lot of trouble sometimes <laughs> you work on more than one book at a time I research more than one book at a time but I uh, will only write one book at a time and I will only illustrate one of the craftsman books at a time how do you go about getting your information for these books well there's them? a lot of traveling involved mm -hmm. here uh, for example uh, I mentioned uh, the fact that there were six Italian glass blowers who knew how to blow beads in the mm -hmm. glassmaker's mm -hmm. book, and these people were smuggled on pain of death out of Venice and brought to Jamestown. 
and uh, probably they were the first uh, uh, non-bottle blowers <laughs> to come to America. They came here very, very early, 1619, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it was, if I'm not mistaken, or perhaps 1620. Mm -hmm. At any rate, um, I had been to Venice. I had seen these uh, very same uh, bees being blown uh, in the very same way that uh, these uh, six people who were smuggled out of Venice blew them in the 17th century. Hmm. I also uh, had visited glass-making establishments here in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I think I was quite familiar with, with the entire process of blowing glass. That makes a lot of traveling, though. When oh, you're there's sick. some traveling, yes, but absolutely. I mean, uh, of course, however, when you're out traveling for one, uh, do you make sketches and so forth of something that you... I usually make a written note and mm -hmm. a, a very small little sketch. Uh, I don't leave it to a mental note. Mm -hmm. We like the way you tell what's going on in several other countries at the time these, the, of the craftsmen here in America. Now, that mean, must mean a lot of uh, reading and research this way, too. There's it? a great deal of reading that, that, that's involved mm -hmm. uh, here, uh, the reading of uh, other historians. Mm -hmm. I am uh, not principally a historian. Mm -hmm. uh, as I say, I'm a craftsman. But you must relate history, economics, sociology, uh, what have you, to the craft. Because mm -hmm. without these things, it just wouldn't be a craft. Mm -hmm. You bring this out in your books. Uh, yeah. how so so there is a lot of reading mm -hmm. uh, involved. Mm -hmm. When you do the, the drawings, do you draw your people from live models? No. I think the last time I used a live model was in art school. <laughs> <laughs> you do it from imagination and from memory of... Uh, from knowledge. Knowledge, uh, in other words. Imagination enters into it, of mm -hmm. course, because you, you must be able to uh, create a figure that will mm -hmm. do a specific uh, uh, thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I might say here that uh, I spent uh, some 14 years in life classes. I even dissected cadavers at New Haven Medical School. Michelangelo. Well, in a way it was. This was part of the training, mm -hmm. and uh, I did that for six weeks. And uh, uh, I think I know uh, something about the superficial nature of, of the human mm -hmm. body in order to uh, create a figure uh, on a uh, piece of paper. I think this is essential uh, in knowing how the body works mm -hmm. in order to draw it. Not only that, in order to even distort it. In order to twist it and make it believable, even mm -hmm. though it couldn't possibly exist in that way. Mm -hmm. I think you have to know, you have to have a basic knowledge of the body. You're doing your pictures of the tools and the um, hats and the wigs and so forth. Uh, do you do those from looking at them? Oh yes, I don't imagine the tools. <laughs> uh, I track them down. Uh, I know of several collections. I know of one collector right here in Westport mm -hmm. uh, who has a, an amazing collection of um, carpenter's tools dating back to the 18th century, 17th and 18th century, joiner's tools. And uh, they are in cabinet maker's tools. Mm -hmm. They're exquisite. They're in perfect condition. And so I see these things. Uh, I use my Polaroid camera. I photograph some of them. I think I showed you a photograph of a, of a doctor cutting, cutting off somebody's leg. But what I was interested in back in the 16th century or 17th century, what I was interested in here was the knife he was using. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. The shape of that tool. knife. Yes. Which was extremely important. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this, happened, this photograph was made at uh, Plymouth Plantation. And that was for the doctor. Uh, the doctors. There. Mm -hmm. You don't have a collection of your own then of uh, tools and uh, this sort of thing. Not unless uh, the t not not of seventeenth century tools, not mm -hmm. ancient tools. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. I do not. In fact, uh, such things as medical tools, for mm -hmm. example, uh, uh, the Army uh, Surgeon General's office mm -hmm. uh, has a collection uh, that goes back to the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. Now these things are available. Mm -hmm. You can track them down. Uh, you're uh, in looking at your home. It is very modern. Well, I like to look at uh, myself and my family uh, as uh, we are modern people. Uh, I'm a child of this century, and all that implies. And uh, all I'm trying to do is uh, create a connection between the, uh, uh, the craftsmen of the 18th century in America and the circumstances in which they had to work, which were awful, terrible. Uh, and uh, things weren't easy. And uh, it wasn't easy to make these things. And yet, somehow or other, these people had pride in the things that they made. And I would just like our youngsters to know that and not to think that history started two years ago and that what they are today is simply what they happened to be two, two years ago. Mm -hmm. I think history started a long time ago, and it's in our genes, and mm -hmm. we ought to know why. This is a very painless way you're doing it <laughs> for them. Well, I try to make the pictures very direct, for mm -hmm. one thing. I try to make them simple but dramatic. Mm -hmm. To, uh, to make uh, indelible images. I don't like to make pictures that people walk away from and, and never remember them. Mm -hmm. uh, they may not like them, but they won't forget them so fast. <laughs> 
And that is one reason why in these craftsman books I have resorted to the, the intense uh, black and white mm -hmm. that appears there. I do not intend to recreate the period, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, with every little crack in the cobblestone of the street. Mm -hmm. In the wig makers, for instance, uh, we're happy because you uh, give us pictures of many kinds of wigs and not just one or two. Um, well, there were hundreds of different kinds mm -hmm. of wigs in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if we made wigs today, in the same way that they made them then. I doubt very much whether wigs would be a fashion today. <laughs> Our wigs today are very well ventilated. Uh, they're lightweight, uh, they're easy to put on, and what's more, you don't have to shave your head. <laughs> well, now this on. brings up a point. Uh, somewhere we read that um, the men shaved their heads in the 18th century and wore wigs so that it would be easier to keep the lice out of their heads now. Is, did you ever come upon this anywhere when you were? No, I don't recall coming upon that anywhere, but uh, I know something about lice. Uh, uh, lice can, uh, can crawl anywhere. I think I had a few on me in the, in the army uh, <laughs> in North Africa, and uh, so I don't think wigs really had much to do with that. I think they shaved their heads simply because these wigs were heavy, and they were, they were hot, and uh, they weren't easy to wear. These people really were a slave to fashion. And even the poor people uh, wore them, didn't they? Or yes, the oh yes, them? yes, yes. Which brings up a question that uh, we have asked. Uh, do you have any idea how much they cost? I happen to say the, the vaguest notion. I don't think it would really be important to know how much they cost unless you could relate the worth of uh, the money, like the pine tree showing, mm -hmm. or, uh, to our present-day dollar. Mm -hmm. uh, I imagine um, the wigs, the better wigs, were very expensive. They were custom-made. Uh, you had to have your head measured. Uh, and I am sure that there were people who could not afford to, to buy an expensive wig, so they must have had uh, some arrangement uh, where they were able to buy custom-made, too. Mm -hmm. They were all custom-made, a rather less expensive wig. Mm -hmm. Because it just everybody wore them, didn't they, practically? Practically, yes. Mm -hmm. The books that you illustrate with Aniko Serrani uh, are so very good. I mean, they, they have something about them that... Um, we just can't put our finger on How do you feel about these books? Well, I feel very close to them. Uh, Aniko and I have worked very hard for a number of years now to try to create something here in book form uh, that you don't find at other levels of book creation. Uh, these are picture books, yet they're not picture books. Uh, we like to feel that we're uh, perhaps bridging various age levels. We don't like to think in terms of age levels. Certainly when I make these pictures, uh, I like to uh, think of them as an adult. Uh, but more than that, what we are trying to do here, and we are collaborators, and I must say we, uh, in this, uh, to create what I like to call symbolic realism. Uh, we're trying to, to present an image uh, to children that is not just a visual image, but has some substance uh, to it. Then ride the cold wind. Um that book, uh, you don't just read it, you don't just look at it, you, you feel it. Yes, I, I understand that. Well, you're perfectly right, because here I was more interested in producing a uh, uh, an experience relating to a cold mountain lake. And this that came mountain. through. And I think, uh, I think it came through, mm -hmm. and I think um, other people think it came through. And, I, and that is the essence of art, mm -hmm. is the experience that, that uh, you can generate. Mm -hmm. It is the life of the thing, and if you cannot produce the life of the thing, of anything, that doesn't live, even on a, a page, no matter how pretty that page is, I don't think it's worth anything. Did you uh, draw as a boy? Oh, yes. Uh, in fact, my uh, father uh, took pictures uh, with his old Kodak. I won't tell you how long ago it was, because as I say, I'm a young man. Uh, <laughs> when I was about uh, five or six years old, and uh, these uh, photographs uh, show me drawing in a sketch pad. And uh, I've been drawing ever since I'm five, mm -hmm. and uh, it's uh, never been anything else. Well, then you worked particularly in art all through high school? Well, I was put in a professional school when I was eight years old, and uh, uh, my apprenticeship is a, is a long one. Uh, I went to the public schools in New York, but while I was going to these public schools, uh, I was getting another kind of education. And now, how many hours a day would you have uh, spent at the school? Well, at that time, uh, it was one day a week, I remember, and I went all day Saturday. Hmm. Uh, I don't recall it being any more than that. Of mm -hmm. course, eventually, I went to other schools like the Art mm -hmm. Students League and, and other mm -hmm. places. There was the Army, and mm -hmm. uh, I even uh, 
in the Army, uh, I continued in a way my art education because I became a, a map maker and I produced uh, two or three murals in the Army for Army Special Services and one for the American Red Cross. That one was in Hawaii. And the uh, the other one was in North Africa, which I saw burned right in front of my face. It was destroyed. And uh, However, uh, when I came out of the Army, I went to Yale, mm -hmm. and uh, Yale Art School, and of course that was rigorous uh, training. I think it stood me in good stead, mm -hmm. and I have never been sorry. Well, it must have, by the looks of the awards and so forth over there on the wall, I think it must have uh, done some good. <laughs> but you had to have this natural talent to start with, too, uh, from the fact that you showed Well, I don't know whether there's a, na a natural talent for it or somebody pushes you into it. <laughs> well, in other words... Uh, All children know, draw. Yes. All children create. But, uh, uh, you're, in other words, your family encouraged you along this line. Yes. Mm -hmm. Of course, yes. Uh, somewhere along the line, I wanted to be a baseball player, too, oh. you know. <laughs> Uh, well, that's a good, uh, a good healthy and I was balance. A good, I was a good ball player. <laughs> well, good. Um, did you you played in sports in high school and yeah. and and, uh, and, so on. Uh, and baseball was your favorite? Then I take. I love to play baseball. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you don't go out and help your son. Oh yeah, pitch, yeah, we, uh, yeah, we had, Oh yes, we have a couple of mitts around. Did you like to write as a youngster? I don't recall uh, liking to write. Mm -hmm. uh, I drew all the time, mm -hmm. and all my energies were were uh, put in that direction. And uh, I don't really recall uh, an interest in writing. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, this writing started as an adult uh, when you decided you wanted to, to express yourself along with your pictures. No, I, it, interestingly enough, the first piece of writing that I did that was published was at the end of the war, uh, where the uh, unit that I was in, this battalion, decided to produce a book on its uh, history. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a committee assigned to this thing, and I was one of the committee, and there were four or five of us that were going to put this book together. Even at that time, I never thought I'd ever illustrate a book in my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember writing uh, the preface to that uh, battalion history, and it's just a short paragraph, and I remember sweating over this thing for days and days and days, and I think it was only about 40 words long. <laughs> but I enjoyed doing it. Uh, beyond that, the rest... Uh, kind of just fell in place, mm -hmm. and only recently. Mm -hmm. I still consider myself a painter and an artist rather than, a, than an author. Mm -hmm. And if you want to put it all together, say craftsman. I think that would include it all. Now, what was your favorite subject when you went to school? Well, of course, art. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, I enjoyed history, mm -hmm. always. Uh, history always spoke to me. Uh, there was something always thrilling about the, the exploits of... Uh, various and sundry heroes mm -hmm. and, and uh, the mountains they had to climb mm -hmm. and the obstacles that were put in the way of various people and how and the achievements that they made mm -hmm. against all odds mm -hmm. and uh, I was always impressed by history and and the events uh, that shaped our lives mm -hmm. well Mr. Fisher it has been so interesting talking with you tonight well I enjoyed it too <laughs>